Hi, welcome back to INST 314, Statistics for Information Science. I'm your host, Sean Jansen, and we're continuing our exploration into the realm of inference, part three here, and we're going into topic 7.7, .7, where we're going to cover simulation in the central limit theorem. Now, in previous lecture videos, we talked about things like some of the various distributions you might encounter. We talked more so about the normal distribution, which is the focus of this particular inferential module, where it led us into z-scores and confidence intervals, and then eventually into the sampling distribution. Now we're going to talk about sampling I'm sorry, we're going to talk about simulation and the central limit theorem, which heavily underpin most of the things that we've been learning about so far. Now, let's talk a real quick recap about the sampling distribution. It starts out with the premise that the null hypothesis is true, and we need to disprove it where the null says that there's no difference, no effect, and whatever it is that we happen to be measuring, and that we have some given observation that we're trying to find, and that the sampling distribution forms from taking samples over and over and over again, and the central point of those, such as the mean, we get a mean of means that form these sampling distributions. And we can use that sampling distribution to help us identify a particular probability of a value that we find to see where in that sampling distribution it lies and the probability that it could have been occurred. And from there, we can go ahead and use that to determine our basis for a given initial assumption going back to the null hypothesis. Now there's a couple ways of doing this. One, we can use simulation, and two, the central limit theorem to help us approximate the sampling distribution. Let's start with simulation. So with simulation, there's one basic strategy. You have some variable that you're trying to model, and we randomize it. And we, from that randomized variable, we go ahead and compute a point estimate. Now let's use the example from before of our spoofed phishing email. We had participants that were sorted into two groups, treatment and control, and that experiment had two possible outcomes, if you identified the spoofed email or not. Now when we go ahead and put this into simulation, the idea is that we can say if these treatment and control groups were independent or not. It wouldn't matter which group you were in, that you'd have the same sort of likelihood of finding if you had approximated your ability to find a spoofed email or not. And we can use this randomization with the simulation to see are these going to be independent or not. So if we were to go ahead and put these into uh, sort of outcomes, there would be four possible outcomes that we're going to model in the simulation. You could be a control that identified the spoof email. You could be in a treatment that did not. You could be in a treatment that did identify it. Or you could be in a control that did not. And when we scramble these outcomes and we give it some additional information about how large our n should be and what the grouping numbers would be between treatment and control, we can check the proportions that are going to come out of this. And what we might find, if we compare the actual to our simulated results, is that with 100 individuals split evenly between treatments and controls, we found of those that specifically identified their uh, emails, that 54% were from the control and 46% were from the treatment. If we look at this with the simulated results, our numbers are going to be rather similar. 58% of the control, and 42% of the treatment. Now, if we were to model this out onto a histogram, where we did samples through the simulation over and over again, so much that we did an N of 30. So we have 30 different samples, and in this histogram, I'm modeling the proportionate of the treatment group that correctly identified the spoofed phishing email. So this, these are people in the treatment that did identify it right. And the proportion of those sampled 30 times forms this distribution of this histogram. And we can see it looks somewhat normal. It may seem a little blocky as we get out into the tails, but how do we sample this over and over and over again? 300 times? 800 times? 1,000 times? This would become much more of the curve that you start to see with the blue curve, that normal density curve, that's overlaid on top of the distribution. It only gets that blocking effect based on the fewer number of samples that we have at the moment. Now, using this simulated sample distribution data here, what we can then do is see if our identification between the treatment and outcome groups are independent. But how do we do this? Remember that we have data from the actual experiment. 46% of the people from the treatment group correctly identified the spoofed phishing email. So we can first just do it visually, plotting out again that histogram, and overlaying it a single line where I cut down at that 0.46. And so we can see it's generally hugging towards the middle. Now, keeping in mind, if our values are out in the tails, those are going to be the ones that are less likely to occur. 
as values occur closer towards the center, they're going to be more likely to occur, occur under the null distribution, assuming the null is true. And the null says that there's no difference. So visually speaking, we can already start to pick out that it might be likely that we're not different from what we would see and that the treatment and control are independent. But let's go ahead and do this a little bit more, uh, shall we say, analytically, where we can use the numbers to help us back it up and not just with a visual inspection. So how unlikely is it that we get a sample statistic of 0.46 if the treatment and group were independent? Well, we need some sort of determinant. So we can say something like the middle 95% of the distribution is likely and outside of that is unlikely. That's getting that idea of that we have to look in the tails to get extreme evidence, things ex that are extreme enough, strong enough that we can go ahead and reject the null. And that 95%, that's referring to that confidence interval. What's the chance that we're going to have some range of values and in between those range of values, we will hope to find the population mean and in this case the population proportion. So we're going to go ahead and say that 95% is our range and how do we know if 0.46 falls inside that determinant? Well, we can go ahead and use the estimates of the sampling distribution to go ahead and help us out. Now the sampling distribution says that it is going to approximate the population mean and the standard deviation of the stand sampling distribution is what we call the standard error which is going to be the distribution from the population. So because we did the simulation of n of 30 and we formed out a sampling distribution, the mean of that sampling distribution was 0.38 and the standard error from that sampling distribution was 0.1. So we can use those as population estimates to go in and conclude and plug in a z-score. So we get our z-score, our value from the experiment was 0.46 minus the sampling distribution mean of 0.38 and then in the denominator, we go ahead and put that standard error of 0.1, and that generates for us a z-score of 0.8. Now, we said before that we we're using a 95% middle ground area to see that that would be the likely area. And if we went ahead and looked at a probability, we find that the probability of a z-score of 0.8 is 0.66, which is inside that 95% range. You have to get out past 95%, or in this case, if we're doing it by the tails, 0.8 it would be 97.5% on the high and 2.5% on the low. Now keep in mind as well, we could also do this with the z-score itself without having to go to the probability because we know that the 95% interval corresponds with z-scores at plus and minus 1.96. And so we could just see that our z-score of 0.8 falls inside the middle ground of negative 1.96 and positive 1.96 saying that it is in that middle ground of being likely. So in this case, our estimate here of 0.46 of the possible identification for the treatment group, it's not statistically significant and therefore the treatment and control groups are indeed independent. Now let's go ahead and talk a little bit about the central limit theorem. The central limit theorem, we can use this most of the time rather than simulations to estimate our sampling distribution. And I'm going to read for you a rather textbook sort of definition because it is such a strong and important fundamental to statistics. For any trait or variable, even those that are not normally distributed in the population, as sample size grows larger, the sampling distribution of the sample means will become normal in shape. And there's multiple versions of how we use the CLT. We're going to use it when we talk about proportions and means. Talking about it for proportions, we have certain conditions that need to be met in order to apply the assumptions for the central limit theorem. Now, the first condition for proportions is that our data has to be random and it has to be independent in our sample. We also have to have a large sample. And when we're dealing with proportions, we talk about samples in terms of them being successes and failures. We're not saying that something's right or wrong by success and failure, or that you did better or worse. It's just simply saying that you have some sort of binary outcome, and that binary outcome is either going to be one or the other, which you are identifying as a, as a success or failure. And we say success is defined as being greater than 10 when you take n, your sample size, multiply that by the proportion for success. And that failure is hopefully greater than 10 when we take n times 1 minus p. And also the last condition is that our sample size has to be less than 10% of the population. And if we've met all of those conditions, then according to the central limit theorem, we're going to get the distribution of p hat, which is going to be the sample proportion, and it is going to become normal with a mean equal to p, which is the population proportion, and at a standard deviation equal to the square root of p times 1 minus p divided by n, where n is the sample size, so that it becomes that your sample proportion p is indeed normally distributed at normal distribution p, square root of p times 1 minus p, divided by the square root of n.
So we don't need a sampling distribution. As long as we met these three conditions, we can already then assume that P is going to be normally distributed and we can apply the rest of our analyses moving forward from there. The CLT for means is similar, very similar, except in we still have random and independent samples. We still assume that the sample is less than 10% of the population. However, because it's means and not proportions, we don't have to worry about the successes and failures. We just have to know that a large sample is defined by having an n larger than 30. And then meeting those three conditions, we can say that the central limit theorem states that at a given distribution for x bar, which is our sample proportion, it will become approximately normal with a mean equal to mu and a standard deviation equal to the standard error, which is defined by sigma divided by the square root of n. So your sample mean is going to be normally distributed at mu given a distribution, I'm sorry, a dispersion of sigma divided by square root of n. Now the central limit theorem's principles and its fundamentals, these are powerful. They're underlying most of what we're dealing with with these statistics. Because of central limit theorem, it will tell us the shape, the mean, and the standard deviation of the sampling distribution for that. This is going to be true regardless of the population. So because of this distribution information and its truth to the population, we don't have to worry about normality in the population so long as we've met those conditions. There's a lot of information out there in the world that is not normally distributed, but we can still apply assumptions of normality despite it not being distributed because of the central limit theorem and how it applies to sampling distributions. Now, this, because of these assumptions, it allows us to calculate the likelihood of a given statistic for the null hypothesis being true for that statistic when we're doing this. So it allows us to say, we have this normal curve, and if we get a statistic far enough out into the tails, we can go ahead and reject the null because the, normal, because the distribution is normal. And so also given the higher the sample size we have, the more certainty we're going to have about the central limit theorem and therefore the sampling distribution. Now when we talk about the sampling distribution and the central limit theorem, we go ahead and say that it's normal so we can go ahead and use our distribution tables to find the areas. Now oftentimes we don't know the population mean, but we can get the mean of the sampling distribution. This is fine because the, the mean of the sampling distribution holds the same value as mu, the population mean. And often we don't know the population standard deviation sigma, but we can estimate the sampling deviation of a sampling distribution, which is fine because it, the sampling deviation of the sampling distribution is equal to sigma, which is divided by the square root of n. So because we can approximate the sampling distribution, we can use that to obtain population level estimations. Now we have three distributions. I just want to go and compare and contrast a little bit here. We have the sample distribution, which is what we're going to get when we go collect the data. Its actual shape is going to vary based on whatever it is that we happen to be varying, I'm sorry, measuring. It has a central tendency of x bar and a dispersion standard deviation equal to s. We can get the sampling distribution, and it, according to the central limit theorem, is always going to be normal in shape, assuming we've met the conditions for the CLT. It has a measure of central tendency we represent by mu sub x, which based on what we just said previously, approximates mu. It's equal to mu. And it is dispersed by sigma sub x, which is equal to sigma divided by the square root of n. And at the population, its actual shape, it's going to vary based on whatever the variable is that we're measuring as it naturally occurs. It's represented by mu and dispersed by sigma. So that's just a brief overview of the central limit theorem and a gentle introduction to it. And I'm going to wrap up this particular video here, and I'll see you all in the next video where we talk about choosing an alpha level.